NBC's Gabe Gutierrez is traveling with the president in Italy. Evelyn Farkas is a former senior advisor to the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, former deputy assistant secretary of defense for Russia and Ukraine, and the executive director of the McCain Institute. And David Ignatius is foreign columnist and associated editor of the Washington Post, as well as an MSNBC contributor. So, Gabe, can you give us more details on what is happening in Italy, what this deal does and doesn't do? Good afternoon, Jose. Well, this deal is meant to send a strong message to Russia, and it comes just a day after the U.S. Ex expanded sanctions against Russia. Now, as you alluded to, this is meant to show a commitment to Ukraine over the next 10 years, and the U.S. is promising to train and equip uh, Ukraine's military. Now, what it is not doing, Jose, is committing U.S. troops to go into Ukrainian territory at any point to defend it. But again, this is a, an executive um, agreement. A bilateral security agreement, excuse me, being signed by President Biden in just a short time here within the hour. Uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky and he and him are set to hold a joint, joint press conference. Exactly. So, Evelyn, no guarantee of more aid. What is the value of this agreement? Well, Jose, I think that if you look beyond the money, and, you know, maybe we'll get into other sources of money that Ukraine will now have access to. It means that the United States will be um, directed by the executive branch to help Ukraine build its defense industry. Um, that actually, you know, in the in the bureaucratic world does mean something. It, it lifts up a lot of restrictions on maybe technology sharing and um, may provide also some additional um, boost to investors. Uh, they may also have to go through U.S. Um, US investment channels, so our, our um, DFC, but, um, which is a bank that provides um, loans to companies that want to invest and do business in places like Ukraine. So I think that it, it is actually significant, and obviously the political signal that, that we are saying, you know, we are committed to Ukraine regardless of whether they are a member of NATO. A very strong political message, no doubt. David, how is the reality on the ground in Ukraine years into this Russian attack into that homeland? So the situation increasingly returns to one of stalemate. The Russians appeared to, to be on the offensive in the long period when the Ukraine was waiting for U.S. arms to arrive after the House of Representatives delayed approval of those arms. Now that they're arriving, now that the U.S. has eased restrictions on how Ukraine can use them, the Ukraine can now fire them into Russian, some weapons into Russian territory, it appears that the Russian offensive has slowed. Most reports from the front describe that. At the same time, Ukraine is using the new weapons it has, uh, especially the attack of his missiles to attack aggressively uh, Russian-occupied Crimea. So we're in a situation where, uh, again, uh, the, the two sides, uh, at enormous cost, are, are fighting it out without much gain on the ground either way. I think the agreement that President uh, Biden is signing with President Zelensky is symbolism, but it's important symbolism. It's a message to Ukrainians who are bloodied by this war so severely that the United States remains with them. There's a sense of continuity. Uh, and it's a message to Russia. Don't assume you can wait this out. Don't assume that you can just wait for Donald Trump to be elected or the American public to become exhausted with the war, because here's a commitment, uh, executive order, yes, but like the military commitments we have with many countries around the world who are allies, not formal treaty allies, but uh, have, have military relationships with us uh, just the same. Ukraine now has one formally, and I think in that sense, it's important symbolism. And, David, just wondering, I mean, the, the losses that Russia has been taking for a long time now, I mean, some say maybe up to a 1,000 losses per day in this campaign. Is this something that Putin can continue having without any cost? So, uh, Jose, it's, it's a meat grinder for both sides. The most recent U.S. Yeah. estimates are over 350,000 Russian dead and wounded in this war over two years. Putin seems to be able to sustain the war. 
he was reelected, but the polls suggest he's probably more popular now than when the war began. There is a point at which the Russians become exhausted, but there's no sign that, that it's been reached yet. There were, interestingly, some financial troubles in, in Moscow uh, financial markets today. If, if life gets much more difficult for the average Russian in Moscow or St. Petersburg, maybe you'll see a, a beginning of a popular uh, rebellion against the policy, but I don't see any sign of that yet. Yeah, I mean, Evelyn, you were talking about this, the, the very strong messages that are coming out of the G7 meeting vis-a-vis -vis Russia, the messages of, you know, do not, for example, even expanding some sanctions on, on Russia. However, Russia is really, their reaction, for example, they just sent ships, three military ships and a Russian nuclear submarine to Cuba. Moscow says it's armed with the new top-of-the-line hypersonic missiles, these three uh, ships are, and they're just, you know, right off the coast of Florida soon. What does it tell you about Russia's geopolitical strategy right now? Well, I think, um, Jose, to, to kind of um, echo or, or um, underscore what my very smart friend David Ignatius just said about the, you know, Russia, the situation in Russia, it doesn't look very good. Vladimir Putin is clearly very upset about a couple of things. Um, first, the fact that we now, you know, took away the restrictions that we had placed on the use of the weaponry we were providing the Ukrainians so that they can now use them to attack valid military targets inside of Russia. And, um, you know, we are now providing them with this political reassurance and this very public sign of support. Um, Vladimir Putin got so mad that, yes, he sent warships to Cuba. And that is actually an escalation from the past. When I was in the Pentagon in 2014, 2015, it wasn't uncommon to see Russia sending spy ships, intelligence gathering ships, to um, off the, even the U.S. coast. So in 2014, 2015, after the Crimea invasion and our robust response, the, the Russians sent an intelligence gathering ship, uh, of the small um, group of ships, off the coast of Florida. They lingered there for quite some time. This is an escalation because these are warships. The other quick thing I want to mention is that today they announced that they are accusing, they're indicting um, Evan Gerskovich, the Wall Street Journal reporter, that they have jailed, imprisoned, um, with no um, right to trial thus far. And, of course, he won't get a free trial. They're, they're calling him a spy. So that's another thing that happened today. Again, more evidence that um, Putin doesn't like this, and he's, he's basically um, not doing very well. This is, this is not welcome for him. You know, David, I'm just wondering your thoughts on this. I mean, you know, you, one immediately when one hears, you know, ships and warships, thinks of October 1962 and, and certainly the 13 days that RFK wrote about. Uh, but it's it's a clear message from Putin that this is something that is happening right at the U.S. back door. So, Jose, I think you got it exactly right. This is a deliberate attempt to evoke the most serious crisis um, in terms of nuclear confrontation um, in Cold War history, the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, uh, Putin has done it very deliberately, just as he and former President Medvedev keep speaking about possible use of tactical nuclear weapons. They're trying to intimidate uh, the United States and Europe by throwing up the specter that this could escalate into a nuclear conflict. That's part of Russia's strategy. I think increasingly, as U.S. officials watch this, they're skeptical that, that Russia really will take these steps. I mean, for goodness sakes, Russia's having trouble even moving west in Ukraine, a tiny country. Does it really propose to take on the United States and Europe in some major conflict that would escalate up to, up to, to nuclear war? It, it just, it, there's, a, there's an as, aspect of this, I think, that really is, as we said earlier, theater. It's, it's, meant, to, it's meant to frighten. It's meant to, to break resolve. Um, I'd, be, I'd be very curious about how the U.S. responds to this in terms of its own signaling. When another country does something like this, sends, sends nuclear uh, equipped ships I into a port, there's often something we don't see, but it's meant to signal back. We get it. We match you in the same symbolic way. And so, Gabe, also today, the G7 reached a deal to use profits from the $300 billion in frozen Russian assets to back a $50 billion loan to the Ukrainians. What can you tell us about that? 
Yeah, Jose, the G7 countries have been trying to hash out the deal, uh, the details of this uh, for a while. But the G7 leaders have agreed, as you said, to take that $300 billion in frozen Russian assets, which, again, have been um, started back in 2022. There's about $300 billion in frozen Russian assets across the world, much of it held in Belgium. But they plan to use the interest off of that, which is estimated to be about $50 billion over the next 10 years. The G7 leaders will give that money to Ukraine up front in the form of a loan to help Ukraine on the battlefield. Now, Jose, before I let you go, I do want to tell you something that um, I was just told. President Biden was asked a question just within the past few moments. He was asked whether he had spoken about the uh, a, ce a possible ceasefire uh, deal in the Israel-Hamas war. The president confirmed that he had already spoken about that deal with world leaders. He was asked whether he was confident there would be a deal. He responded no, but that he still has hope. Jose? Thank you for that last minute uh, update on that. And, and David, I just want your thoughts on, you know, the, the President Biden is going there to southern Italy to meet with uh, these leaders that have a different political reality just a couple of days ago because of the elections that were held throughout Europe. So th this is a, a world and a, a Europe where in incumbents are, are, are under fire. Um, there, there is some uh, rightward movement uh, in, in Germany and other countries. There's leftward movement in Britain where Prime Minister Sunak is likely to lose to the British Labour Party. So it's hard, I think, to draw a single trend other than voter frustration with the status quo, something we're very familiar with in the, in the United States. Uh, but but it's, you're seeing that all over the world. I think it's interesting to see the G7, this group that's supposed to symbolize stability, uh, continuity, the major powers sailing forward. E each country in some ways is, is facing uh, very uh, uncertain going because of domestic political pressures.